Welcome everybody to our session, but what about those medium and low vulnerabilities? Welcome to B-Side San Antonio. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nikki Robinson. She's a senior site for security engineer by day with XLA, and she's also an adjunct professor at Capital Technology University in the evenings. Her main passions include vulnerability management, continuous monitoring, and improving IT and security relationships. She loves to blend academic research, real life technical experience and leadership principles into presentations. She also holds multiple industry certifications, including CISSP and CEH. Also just had the pleasure of talking to her about the DC area and all the good food out there. So let's go ahead and turn it on over. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, we were just uh, chatting about uh, crabs over here in Maryland. So we were, uh, uh, all right, we were talking about those. Let me share my presentation real quick. All right. So um, thank you. First of all, thank you, everybody, for uh, for coming to the session. Um, uh, as mentioned, I'm going to be specifically speaking about low and medium vulnerabilities. Uh, a little bit about vulnerability chaining, some complexity issues, some things like that. Uh, so thank you for joining me. Um, and of course, thank you for B-Sides SATX for having me. Uh, happy to be here for sure. Uh, so I actually just recently switched jobs. I am actually a security architect with IBM now. Um, still an adjunct professor teaching everything from quantitative methods to incident response and everything in between. Uh, I do hold a doctorate of science in cybersecurity, which is what uh, we'll get into a little bit, but what got me really, really excited about this topic um, and, and why I've spent so much time researching it. Uh, I'm also working on a PhD in human factors, uh, and I've, I've done some other research where I'm kind of blending cybersecurity and human factors and, and trying to uh, solve some problems there, uh, and then as well as some industry certifications as well. Uh, quick disclaimer, all thoughts, feelings, views expressed in this presentation are my own. Uh, they do not reflect my employer, employers. Um, I do these talks and I do this research just because I love it. And I love to share kind of what I've found or uh, problems I'm seeing in the industry. And uh, so that's that. And then um, so quick rundown of the agenda, what kind of what I want to cover here. Uh, we're going to kind of cover CVSS scoring, so the Common Vulnerability Scoring System, uh, talk about vulnerability scoring. Uh, then we're going to talk about some medium vulnerabilities, some low vulnerabilities, uh, as well as vulnerability chaining, and then hopefully some actionable items that, you know, if you aren't aware of this or, you know, maybe you're learning about it, uh, some things that you could kind of take back to your own organization, take back to your own team, and maybe do some investigation. So... Um, I know this is a lot on one slide. <laughs> I, I tried to break this down, but I felt like it was really important um, when we're talking about how vulnerabilities are scored uh, to really dig deep into how CVSS scores vulnerabilities. Um, and I wanted to mention that, you know, when when I was doing this research um, with my doctorate of science, uh, so I got really interested in how low and medium vulnerabilities. Um, maybe how they interact, what is vulnerability chaining, how are they scored, uh, how how did we come to the conclusion that these vulnerabilities are scored as low and medium? That, that really made me interested, uh, mostly because at the time uh, where I was working, we didn't really have a lot of time to work on low and medium vulnerabilities. And as I talk with other people and I work on other teams, I'm starting to find that that's kind of a similar pattern, you know, whether it's in the public sector um, or private sector, I, I think sometimes it can be really challenging depending on the size of your team, especially small to medium sized businesses uh, might have a more difficult time getting to these low and medium vulnerabilities. Um, so I wanted to start by kind of breaking down the CVSSS, CVSS scoring. Um, so this is how, for the most part, we score vulnerabilities and how we see them in our products. So like if you're using Tenable or Qualys, any vulnerability scanning uh, and reporting software, you're probably going to be based off of the CVSS scores. And typically, you'll see a CVSS 2.0 and a 3.0 score. I'll get into that a little bit more as well. But basically, right now, the standard is 3.0, uh, or excuse me, 3.1, they're on now, but uh, 3.0 is where a lot of the scoring comes from. So the CVSS scoring is broken down into three groups. You can see here, the basic metric group, the temporal metric group, and the environmental group. These three groups are then broken down into several other subcategories. 
each one of these categories is looked at and evaluated, and they're all brought together to bring up that vulnerability score that you would see, whether it's a 5.4 or a 9.8, which would be a critical. Um, so all of these things make up the CVSS score. I felt like it was really important to bring that up because when I started um, you know, asking questions about low and medium vulnerabilities, and was like, oh, don't worry about those. I was like, well, now I need to really understand why they're scored low. And then should I be concerned about them? Because I started looking at, uh, let's take, for example, an SSL certificate vulnerability. A lot of them are scored as low, uh, but you could have maybe you know, 10, 20, 30 SSL vulnerabilities scored as low. Um, and if you don't start to fix them, they could start to pile up. Um, so I, I started really looking into those. And uh, even, I don't know if anybody remembers in January 2017, uh, Spectre Meltdown, when that vulnerability came out, there were actually a lot of vulnerabilities attached um, to that kind of family of vulnerabilities. And a lot of them were scored as low and medium. Um, and that also sort of piqued my interest because even if they are scored lower, these vulnerabilities still can be exploited. And some of them are actively being exploited in the wild. Um, their, their scores may change as they're exploited in the wild. Uh, but you know, if you aren't uh, taking a look at them or, or maybe you don't have time to look at them, it's possible that they could still be exploited. Um, so now that we've kind of covered vulnerability scoring a little bit, I wanted to talk about some specific examples of medium and low vulnerabilities and uh, sort of highlight why they're so important, um, or at least just to look at. Um, so the first one that I picked, I wanted to pick some newer vulnerabilities that were released. Um, and of course, if you have any questions, I included references here uh, to both the NVD, the National Vulnerability Database, where the vulnerabilities are housed, um, as well as the actual advisories that uh, give more information on the vulnerabilities. So the first one here, uh, this was released, I believe, in February or March, uh, might have been April of this year. Uh, this is CVE 2021-2164. This is uh, ultimately was scored as a medium. Uh, this vulnerability, uh, specifically in Jenkins dashboard, and uh, this is the um, it's the improper neutralization of input. Uh, during web page generalization, which leads to a cross-site scripting vulnerability. So ultimately it was scored as a medium, and there's a couple of reasons why. The first is that vendors, when they're submitting these vulnerabilities or you know these known vulnerabilities, they can include as much information as they want or as little information as they want. So depending on how much information they want to give to to industry and to those working on the vulnerabilities uh, that may change the score of the vulnerability as well as how much information is available for this particular vulnerability and i'm not calling out any type of software i'm just saying for the specific vulnerability there is one small paragraph that's included on the website so it is difficult to get uh, how much information is is really available about this one um, just kind of what we know is uh, kind of a, sh a short blurb on their website uh, but basically, this is exploitable with view and configure permissions. So what I thought was interesting about this, you would, as an attacker, you would have to have uh, view and configure permissions uh, to, to exploit this vulnerability. However, if this was on a public-facing web server, and let's say any user that logs in or creates an account uh, has view permissions, they would be able to exploit this vulnerability. Now, there may be other controls in place that might mitigate this, which would be great. Um, maybe there aren't. Maybe because it was scored as a medium, which is sort of what I'm getting at, maybe because it was scored as a medium, maybe it doesn't have to be reme remediated for you know, 90 days. Um, sometimes uh, different vulnerability management programs, you know, they might have, you know, you've got 30 days to fix criticals, 60 to fix highs, and you've got 90 days to fix lows and mediums or something like that. Um, hopefully they're not waiting 30 days to fix criticals, but it's possible. So it's possible in the 90 days that this vulnerability has been sitting out there, if there were other priorities, other projects, other resources, other, other things that were more important than this, uh, that maybe it's still unremediated. You know, we're in June now, if it came out in April, maybe it's still sitting there unremediated and it could be exploited depending on, you know, the setup of, of a company or anything, but uh, someone could, 
you know, run a scan, a malicious attacker could run a scan to see if this vulnerability exists and possibly exploit it. Uh, and if they're able to get in with this cross-site scripting vulnerability, uh, they may be able to leverage other vulnerabilities once they get in uh, to potentially elevate privileges or, you know, hopefully not full system compromise, but who knows? And we'll get a little bit more into that once I talk about vulnerability chaining. So for my second vulnerability, I wanted to talk about uh, talk about a low vulnerability. So this is CVE 2021-2308, uh, scored as a 2.7, which is pretty low. Um, again, the re references are down in the bottom if, if you wanted to take a look. Uh, the interesting thing about this vulnerability, this is in MySQL uh, server, also in Oracle MySQL and uh, can be seen in NetApp uh, software because it may have a MySQL backing. So the interesting thing about this vulnerability is that uh, it's not just one vulnerability. It could possibly be one vulnerability in multiple products. Again, if a the patch is applied or on you know either NetApp or in Oracle MySQL, it's very possible that it would re resolve this vulnerability as well. Um, but if this vulnerability is sitting out there uh, on a MySQL server, the implication is that you know a it, it's easily exploitable, but mostly because an attacker would have to have highly privileged access anyway. So that sort of negates it, right? It's like, well, they'd have to have highly privileged access. They may have already escalated privileges. They may already have access to other things. So why would I worry about this? And that's partially true. Maybe there are other things that are more important. But the concern is, if this vulnerability is hanging out, let's say you had a malicious insider, someone who already had access to the system, and this vulnerability is hanging out. It's possible that they could exploit this and use this uh, to their advantage. Or uh, let's say they were, maybe they were let go, uh, maybe a disgruntled employee, and they knew that these vulnerabilities existed because the mediums and lows are not uh, resolved. Uh, they could use their insider knowledge to potentially get in, steal information, um, especially in a SQL server or SQL database, uh, who knows what what information you might have in there. Uh, so it's one of those things, it's more about trying to bring awareness to this, that in the grand scheme of things, when you're looking at a thousand vulnerabilities, it's, it's more pertinent to focus on the criticals and highs, but it doesn't mean that we don't look at the mediums and lows. It's that, you know, we need to bring context to what we're looking at and to really understand what these vulnerabilities mean. Um, and again, there's there's good information out there on this vulnerability. Uh, again, it's a, like a paragraph or two paragraphs. Uh, so you don't necessarily have that depth of understanding and knowledge um, just out there uh, to understand kind of what this vulnerability might mean to your environment. Um, and it's really important to kind of when you see vulnerabilities like this that might be affected in multiple products, uh, what are the implications? So what does that mean for me? If, I, if I'm not looking at mediums and lows, if I don't have time to, or if you know we, we have a longer uh, timeline that we remediate vulnerabilities, um, what does it mean for my environment? Where are my critical assets? What am I concerned with? Uh, you know, the first question here, what privileges do my users have? And that blends back into that last vulnerability we looked at where uh, if I'm concerned about how many people have administrative access, uh, do they have local access? Do they have application access? Do they have SQL access? Um, you know, so understanding, you know, your identity and access management policies and who actually has access to these systems, I think is really important when you're looking at vulnerabilities, because if you don't have time to remediate them, but you understand the structure you have in place, maybe you, um, maybe uh, you use micro uh, segmentation for your network. Um, maybe you have a zero or you're implementing a zero trust architecture, things like that. Um, so you, maybe you have other compensating controls in place uh, that would make these vulnerabilities at least null and void, which is great, but it's something to consider, right? Um, and then what access does the attacker gain through the vulnerability? So if the attacker, let's say in the first uh, medium vulnerability we talked about, uh, in that first scenario, let's say they got access to my Jenkins server. Um, maybe that's bad, maybe it's not, depends on my environment, and maybe it depends on what Jenkins server they got access to. You know, maybe I have a test dev environment that's available for my admins uh, that's, you know, I'm not as concerned about. Uh, but maybe 
they are able to leverage that to get into production systems if they are connected somehow. Um, so that's where that consideration comes in of well, what what is that where what servers are actually connected to what servers? What databases are connected? How would someone be able to to traverse through my network? Um, and then of course, do I have mitigating controls in place or could I implement mitigating controls so that, you know, let's say I've got a thousand low vulnerabilities. I don't have time to look at all of those. If I see, you know, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, if I see a number of them are SSL vulnerabilities and I can fix a lot of them with one certificate or maybe one change to an SSL certificate, uh, that might be, you know, getting the biggest bang for my buck, maybe I can fix this with one thing. So it's sort of about, you know, kind of taking this as a whole um, and sort of understanding what the implications are by leaving those low and medium vulnerabilities uh, open in your network, what it might mean to you or to your environment. So here we're gonna talk about vulnerability chaining. So this is sort of where, what I'm getting at by uh, leaving low and medium vulnerabilities uh, unexplored or maybe not looking at them as heavily. Uh, so vulnerability chaining, uh, CVSS has a, they have a really great um, uh, uh, paragraph. They have a really great section about vulnerability chaining in their user guide. Uh, the NIST 853R5 now uh, has a nice little section on vulnerability chaining as well. But I've seen it be called a number of different things, uh, daisy chaining, vulnerability linking. Um, so the idea behind vulnerability chaining is that you're using multiple vulnerabilities during a single attack, but really using low and medium vulnerabilities or lower scored vulnerabilities uh, to create a critical attack. This is a common tactic. Uh, APT groups, I think Shamoon and a bunch of other ones, uh, they've been known to use these techniques. Um, and we know that hackers will try, uh, you know, they're going to try any method they can to get in. And if they have to leverage multiple vulnerabilities, then that's what they'll do to, to you know, get into the systems. Um, so part of the problem that I see and why I got so interested in, in studying this in the first place is that vulnerability chaining is an optional metric for CVSS. Analysts, when they submit these vulnerabilities, they have the option to add how this vulnerability, you know, how one vulnerability could be used with multiple vulnerabilities, but it's not a formal metric. It's not a requirement. Uh, and I started to see that as a potential issue because if we don't know how vulnerabilities could be linked or could be leveraged, especially if you don't, you know, go really, really in depth uh, in vulnerabilities in your vulnerability management program, it could be a gap that is left open, um, you know, that that maybe could be concerning, especially for certain systems uh, that you may want to protect your critical assets, you know, anything that has your business proprietary data or, uh, you know, PII, things like that, that you might want to uh, just maybe take a double, double look at. Um, and of course, this might include vulnerabilities or other products. So just like we saw in that vulnerability that was scored as a low, it is possible that that vulnerability is affected in multiple types of software. So it went from MySQL to being Oracle, C Oracle My MySQL, as well as NetApp, because that product, that application could be used in multiple ways. Uh, so to me, it's more about just kind of having that awareness, like being aware that this is a problem and that attackers, APT groups are leveraging this all the time. You know, they 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 want to get into our systems and they're going to use any way possible. And uh, this is certainly a well-documented uh, way that they get in. Um, I wanted to include some specific examples of vulnerability chaining since we talked about it sort of theoretically. Uh, SQL injection leading to a cross-site scripting, uh, buffer overflow leading to local admin privileges. Um, you know, the idea here is that we, if a, a SQL injection, which I've seen, is scored as a low or a medium, and we're not remediating that for whatever reason, even if it's on our system for 30 days or 40 days, something like that, it's something that could be leveraged. Um, you know, if we are focusing on this critical VMware vulnerability or this critical Netscaler vulnerability, something like that, and we're missing SQL injection or cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, um, we're potentially uh, missing some of the other very uh, possible and you know known ways that attackers might be trying to get into our systems. Um, uh, spear phishing email to download malware, um, which could lead to privilege escalation. 
I don't know where we've seen that before. Um, <laughs> but, you know, spear phishing and phishing emails are used, I mean, all the time to try to download malware or, you know, get you to click on anything. Um, and then, of course, a VPN vulnerability that could give access to other network devices, uh, which could lead to remote code execution. And a lot of these vulnerabilities that we're talking about, SQL injection, cross-site scripting, remote code execution, injection, uh, these are all always on the OWASP top 10. Um, and so I think it's really important, especially if they are scored lower um, and maybe we're missing them because we're just not looking at them, uh, that it could be another way that attackers are you know, leveraging and, and working to try to make their way into our systems. All right, so, all right, I've given you a ton of information, right? We talked about some specific vulnerability examples. We talked about vulnerability chaining and what it means. And then we talked about some very specific examples of how vulnerability chaining is used actively in the wild. So what do I do now? What do I do with this information? Um, I think the biggest thing, and I mentioned this a little bit, but to add context to vulnerabilities, you know, don't just take them at what the score says. Don't just take them at, you know, it's this says it's a, uh, you know, I just need to apply this patch. You know, sometimes it's apply a patch and a registry key. You know, sometimes it's apply a patch and it's a secure configuration setting. Um, so adding context to kind of what you're looking at, you know, doing that additional research, uh, because I know it's helped me a lot to really understand what those vulnerabilities mean. Um, and then, of course, consider the implications in your organization specifically. There's a lot of really great general information out there. You know, NIST has a lot of great guides. There's the RMF. There's the CF, CSF. Um, you know, we've got the MITRE attack framework, so we can start to understand pathing and traversal from attackers. Um, there's a lot of really great uh, general information out there. But I think you have to really, you know, at some point think subjectively and think about how does this affect my system architecture? How does my network look? Um, and so to kind of get a better picture of that, you know, just to really see what you have and then figure out where your greatest risks are, because maybe it isn't low and medium vulnerabilities. Maybe you aren't at the end of the day concerned about them, but it's important to look at them and see how they might affect your environment. Um, and of course, what tools do you have? Um, do you already have this capability available? There are some tools out there like I know Tenable VPR, it's their vulnerability priority uh, rating or ranking uh, can be used to try to help give like heat maps and try to help you understand a bit more about risk in your environment. Uh, and there's some other tools out there that are doing that as well. And then uh, what's the maturity level of your vulnerability management program? So where are you at? Uh, is it really just, hey, we can only fix the criticals and highs right now? That's okay. So then it's like, how do we mature our program? How can we get to that point where I can start to consider low and medium vulnerabilities and how they might be you know, affecting my environment? So it's it's kind of doing some road mapping, thinking about your your maturity model and your how you can actually get there. Uh, so maybe having a vulnerability management expert come in or a consultant or you know, just talking with someone who maybe has you know some really great vulnerability knowledge uh, about how you can mature your program, how you can kind of get to that place uh, where you can start to look at vulnerabilities with more, more context uh, and, and understanding how they affect your organization um, and learning about vulnerabilities. I, uh, I, I joked before I, I got on this uh, call, but I'm like always out here banging my drum for low and medium vulnerabilities because I think it's at least important to understand that uh, they can be exploited and some of them are actively exploited in the wild. Um, that that shocks some people that they're like, oh, I didn't know. I thought if they were scored as low, that maybe people weren't even looking at them, uh, which unfortunately is not the case. Uh, so I always say go out and do research. There's a lot of great information available from CVSS, uh, from you know the MITRE attack framework, and uh, so you can sort of start to to gain that deeper knowledge and that uh, better understanding about how vulnerabilities uh, affect your environment. Um, and I think that takes me right to, I think I've got five minutes left. Um, so uh, I wanted to put my LinkedIn up there. Uh, seriously, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, I, I really mean that genuinely. If you have questions and I can't answer them in this session, uh, please reach out to me because I'm happy to talk more about this. Um, and, and happy to bore anyone for hours on end <laughs> if you want to talk about vulnerability chaining or low and medium vulnerabilities. Um, and that will wrap it up for me. Thank you guys. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, and I don't know if we have any questions.
Thanks, Nikki. Um, not necessarily a question, but there is a comment. Um, compliance bangs that drum with you. Oh, compliance bangs that drum with me. That's great. <laughs> I, I'm always happy to have anybody else out there that's that's banging a drum too. Um, yeah, compliance is compliance is tricky too. Um, and certainly, uh, it's one of those things that you know, from the security engineering and architecture space, it's like how do we help people? Um, understands the importance of it and the complexity of it uh, without, you know, kind of turning people off and making sure people understand that like, hey, this really is important. Um, and I want to help you fix this. That's the other thing too. I don't see any other questions. I, I do have one myself though. Sure. You know, speak, speaking of vulnerability management and um, would you say it would be better for an organization to kind of outsource that to, to maybe prevent any biases for their their posture and, and their their technology? I think it depends on the industry because you when you're outsourced, yeah, I guess it de it really depends because um, you if you don't have a vulnerability management expert or someone that's you know really like deep in the weeds on vulnerabilities then yes i think absolutely there's a lot of great uh companies out there and and you know contractors that are trying to solve this problem too um so yeah if 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 outsourcing is an option um especially if you're a small to medium business and you kind of need to you know get your feet wet with this and just try to figure out like what kind of where you're at um you could hire like a v CISO or someone for like six months and have them come in and just be like, can you help me understand this? Uh, so you can do it on like a contractual basis instead of hiring someone, you know, full time with benefits and everything like that. You could hire someone part time to kind of come in and, you know, and then if you decide that you need more help, you could always leverage that into, you know, a full time position or something like that. Great. Well, great talk. Thank great you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me.